I am uh, John Francesco oh, no. and I'm uh, going to talk about, uh, well, give a little introduction to functional brain connectivity. I was tempted when I, when I was preparing this to ask ChatGPT to prepare it for me. So I did, I did try. And oops, what what ChatGPT did was uh, like prepare a speech, which is not uh, something I can even read. No, but oops, sorry. It it uh, pointed me to this nice image. So I like to think about uh, the brain as something which is kind of isolated uh, and uh, like an island that we have to discover uh, how it works uh, yet. No? This is the outline of, of my, my talk. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to try to define what is brain connectivity. How do we measure it? Uh, when I say brain connectivity, I'm talking about functional brain connectivity, but I, I'll get to that later as well because uh, there are different ways of defining connectivity. And then, uh, as Carolina introduced in the, in the previous talk, there are several ways of measuring it. I will go briefly about fMRI and then a bit deeper into EEG, uh, because it's uh, what I did in my PhD. And, and uh, I will browse briefly through the main techniques that uh, I know and that I found in the literature. Then just a few examples or, or on the relationship between fMRI and EEG. And then finally, I'll, I will show you some examples. So what, what is brain connectivity? Uh, well, we can talk about three types of connectivity. Uh, anatomical connectivity is probably the one that we can understand better because uh, we can understand that neurons connect to each other and they form uh, different pathways or, or highways, as Alejandro said yesterday. So you have a structure in the brain and uh, these regions that are connected uh, and that we can see in an anatomical uh, structural MRI is what we call anatomical connectivity. There are also ways to reconstruct, reconstruct these paths. I, I will show an example later. But this is something that we cannot measure with EEG. So uh, the second definition of connectivity would be functional connectivity. And this is more related to uh, statistical relation, relationships between different brain regions. Whatever this uh, statistical relationship uh, means. And then going a step farther into that, we can talk about effective connectivity if we are able to infer some uh, sense of directionality of, of causal relationship between these brain regions. So if, if some region forces the other region to do something, then we have a cause effect. Uh, uh, and that is uh, more difficult to measure. No? The main hypothesis behind all that uh, simply uh, simply speaking, is that different regions of the brain coordinate or synchronize or whatever you can call it, they couple to uh, uh, engage into some brain activity. No? So uh, if we can measure or we can characterize that, we might have insights on what the brain is doing. So uh, let's see what we are getting from uh, these kinds of, uh, of uh, studies. No? Regarding anatomical connectivity, you may know, uh, or you may have seen images like that, and the top one, which is a diffusion tensor image in which uh, we divide uh, uh, an MRI, an fMRI into small voxels, and we try to uh, 
decide in which way the diffusion of water, for example, is going. So we infer uh, a, a direction. Uh, and if most of the water molecules are going that way, we can say that the thousands of millions of neurons in that uh, small area are going the same way. And you get this nice plot. But as I said, no, in, in a one per one per one millimeter cube, in a voxel, you have a lot of neurons to say that all of them are doing the same, are going the same, are connected the same way. It's at least a leap phase, no, right now. But it's useful for for more for a lot of applications. Functional connectivity instead looks at uh, uh, how different brain regions activate. Uh, while doing some task or after some stimulus, whatever. And we get these nice maps. Actually, the second and the third figure, middle and, and bottom, could be functional or effective connectivity. It's a way of representing how brain regions activate at the same time or how they are connected in, a, in some statistical way. But these are the kind of uh, analysis that, that you can see in the examples as well. All of this is just to say that the brain is a uh, quite uh, complicated organ, so uh, we still don't know exactly how to measure everything. And also, brain connectivity is not something static. No? Alejandro said it very well yesterday. You can have a map of all the roads and highways uh, in a country, but you don't know if, the, if there's going to be a strike and the diagonal is going to be flooded with cars. This is something dynamic. It can take you th 13 minutes or three hours, as it took me yesterday to get home. So, uh, well, you can see in the IEG uh, that the brain is changing dynamically its activity. So it makes sense to think that connectivity behaves in a similar way. From one second to the next, uh, you can be doing very different things your brain is organizing or is coordinating in very different ways. And uh, age also affects this. Carolina said it before that you cannot use the same uh, equipment and you cannot use the same methods to study a child's brain through EEG. And life is, is at this. Our brain changes as we age, uh, it shapes our everything that we experience, but also uh, the connections that we are making throughout our life. Uh, at, at the beginning, uh, our brain grows and then learns, specializes, prunes. Uh, if some of these steps is uh, interrupted or uh, uh, it doesn't go the way it should, whatever it is, uh, you can get different conditions. So. It's not something uh, fully known, but of course, everything in, in brain maturation will affect uh, brain networks and how connectivity uh, uh, develops, no? <clears throat> so, how do we measure all this? We have uh, non-invasive methods, mostly fMRI, EEG and this uh, DTI, diffusion temperature imaging that I mentioned before. I'm not going to explain again why one is cheaper or more useful and whatever. Other, other people have already said that. We also have uh, magnetoencephalography, which uh, Carolina commented briefly, or functional near infrared spectroscopy which I've never uh, worked with it, but it's there. Uh, different kind of sensors placed on the scalp, but uh, uh, it's a different measure. And you have these invasive methods uh, like a stereo EEG or electrocorticography in which either <coughs> these needles of electrodes are placed uh, uh, into the brain probably because there is a good reason to place them to detect uh, some abnormal activity, for example, in, in refractory epilepsy, 
or because uh, you have to plan a surgery and you have to map very well which are the language areas and uh, executive uh, motor areas so that you don't remove anything that is needed. And I've been junking the whole week, but uh, I don't know what the hands-on training this afternoon will be, but just be prepared. <clears throat> okay, so fMRI, uh, as Carolina said before, measures uh, the, let's say, the requirements of oxygen in the in the brain cells. No, it's uh, uh, basically uh, changes in blood oxygenation that uh, reflect the metabolic demand of these neurons. Uh, you can track more or less the changes in time with a certain resolution. And if you see different regions of the brain doing more or less the same, you can assume that they are somehow connected. And this is uh, what we call uh, functional connectivity measured uh, by MRI. Uh, if you go deeper into those references that I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, just remember that in the drive that we set up, uh, we have also added all those papers for you. If, if anyone is interested, you can read them in detail. But one of the, the notes of caution you can see in these references is that when you do a, a stimulus paradigm and measure by fMRI, neurovascular coupling is closely related to the signal, to this, uh, to this uh, readings that you're getting from the brain. And what struck me first is that there is no consensus on how neurovascular coupling works. So we are measuring something, we are seeing something that activates at the same time, we still do not know why we are seeing this or we don't know the general rule. Maybe in particular cases, we know exactly what uh, is happening, but not for any uh, study, and uh, not for all studies. You can see in the bottom right uh, image, an example of the connectivity matrices that are, are usually reported in, in studies. For example, I think this is a Pearson correlation, no? like correlation between the signals obtained into different regions of the brain and then you get a uh, row column yeah. this is the relationship between those two i don't know if you know about that but uh, some years ago there was well the author had some problems to get this published because no uh, serious journal would publish that a dead salmon has uh, brain activity when measured by fMRI. And the whole thing was not about a dead salmon, the whole thing was a, about statistics. As Hamid said yesterday, we don't like statistics. That's why we say machine learning instead of statistical learning, but it's the same. The problem is not that you get this image with a red spot in the middle of the salmon brain, is that somebody messed the the statistical threshold to consider that that was real activity. So obviously the, the dead salmon didn't have any active neurons uh, demanding oxygen at that time. But, but this is something that you have to take into account if you work with this, with this data. In the end, an fMRI is interpreting data that you get from a machine, so it's not something that it's not a picture that you look at and you see as true or false you have to be able to read it and uh, this is something that happens to any method that involves multiple comparisons if you have one thousand or one million voxels uh, you have to be able to detect if there's any spurious uh, result in that because if you set a uh, significance level for any statistical test to 5%, then 5% of 2 million voxels can be active by chance. And this is not real activity that you're getting. This is why statistics plays a, a role in, in inferring what functional connectivity is in, in this case. 
And there's another uh, issue with fMRI, especially for those who, those of us who work with EEG, there was some period of time in which uh, you looked at the fMRIs and uh, they said this region and this region are active. So now I'm going to make an EEG and see if the EEG from those two places uh, are somehow uh, related. And I'm not using 128 electrodes, just two, because I know where to place them. And uh, I avoid all the statistical problems in there. But uh, while this is feasible and sometimes work, it's not always uh, true or you will may be missing something because even when somebody retests uh, or does the same experiment using fMRI, and here is an example, you don't get the same results or not exactly the same results. This is not uh, the case for structural MRI. I mean, if you take a, an, an MRI of your head today and tomorrow, they will, will be probably very similar. But task-related fMRI uh, paradigms have a bad uh, reliability with this, uh, they have bad reprodu reproducibility. And this uh, is a long discussion about how uh, these paradigms were, uh, were made in the first place, because usually we are doing experiments to have or to, to be able to see results at a group level. I mean, I'm using people who have a disorder and controls, and I design the experiment so that then I compare the two groups and I see something. But this does not tell me what one person uh, will look like when I do this, uh, when I apply this fMRI in a task-related experiment. So, uh, this is one of the biggest issues in, in this case for measuring uh, functional connectivity using fMRI. So as I'm a, I, I am a, an EEG guy, I'm going to try to convince you to use EEG or not. First, I won't uh, go again. <laughs> Bless you. I won't uh, explain again what an EEG, but I read something yesterday and somebody was saying the brain is an incredible organ. It's a pity that not everybody, everybody gets one. So the first thing is uh, just make sure you have one. And then you place the electrodes and you get uh, the measurement. As you know, EEG is a non-invasive technique. It has the resolution it has. It depends on how many electrodes you place, where you place them. But the good thing is that we are measuring real uh, activations from the neurons. It's really the depolarization from uh, synchronized pools of neurons. It's closely related to these postsynaptic potentials. And I, I know it's uh, relatively uh, portable silent, uh, low cost, and whatever. But one important thing is that it's very easy to prepare even relate potential paradigms and record these experiments. And I, uh, as I will say later, with quite good repeatability. So you can go through these uh, reference that demonstrate, they prove that changes in cognitive status or uh, uh, the repeatability or reliability of these amplitudes and latencies that we've seen in other talks, they, you, you can get consistent results if you repeat the experiment, which is something you cannot say uh, about fMRI. So even microstates have also appeared in, in some of the talks these days. So in this sense, EEG seems to be more reliable uh, for these uh, this functional uh, activities. So how do we measure uh, functional connectivity using uh, EEG? Well, uh, if you go through the literature, you will find 
I would say hundreds of techniques that can be classified into linear versus nonlinear, depending on the uh, nature of the measure you are applying. You can find model-based uh, measures or model-free. I come from this model-free uh, fashion, but uh, you can find any kind of measure. You can find time domain based measures, frequency domain. You can uh, find this information theoretic domain measures based on the probability distribution of the, the EEG signals. Uh, you can find, or mostly of what I will talk uh, now are pairwise measures. You compare one channel to the other channel, one location to another location, and then two different locations. And then what can I do with all this mess of pairwise comparison? There are measures specially designed to take these into account that are uh, by nature multivariate, but it's not the most common approach. Uh, you can have uh, static, like Pearson correlation, correlation coefficient, just one number. It doesn't take into account uh, time delays or whatever. You can do the cross correlation function and then it becomes dynamic. You have the evolution. Uh, the course over time and uh, you can find different different taxonomies of uh, what connectivity or functional connectivity using EEG is uh, this is one good reference to look at that and you can see here a different uh, a division that i didn't mention before which is directed versus non-direct if you take into account this possible direction of uh, of interaction so, uh, well, let's look a bit into these measures. I'm not going to describe them. I try not to get into the formulas. But, uh, well, as far as I know, the first uh, times that functional connectivity as a term uh, was used was by Carl Friston using neuroimaging data. He did fancy things with uh, PCA to assess correlation or covariance between different brain regions just to do this to assess statistical connections between uh, regions that were activating at the same time if you use Pearson correlation you are not taking into account this time course of the signal you get by fMRI if you use cross correlation you take into account these uh, lags and possible uh, propagation that may be happening in there. If we go a bit deeper into other measures, uh, phase synchronization is one of the uh, most common techniques uh, or most common terms used in the literature. Phase synchronization assesses the degree to which oscillations in, in brain activity are synchronized, no? uh, indicating this coordinated activity between neurons, uh, pool neurons. No? You can extract the instantaneous phase of a signal using whatever technique uh, you want. Uh, Hilbert uh, transform is uh, something that is commonly used. But the, the nice thing about this is that it's not, it's not affected by the amplitude of the signal. So these effects of the brain tissue, the scalp, the skin might be uh, not so important in this guy in this kind of measures. I read somewhere that uh, phase synchronization uh, techniques are suitable for analyzing this interaction, especially when the interaction is too weak to be detected in terms of amplitude. This example by Hoyer et al. I, I have uh, Professor Hoyer in, in my mind because he was the one who introduced me to this. And this is not even an EEG example. He was comparing uh, respiratory and heartbeat to, to understand cardio, respiratory and cardiorespiratory interactions uh, in, the, in our body. But uh, mathematically, the, the measure is the same. If we go a bit deeper, Oh, sorry. If you want to develop 
uh, an intuitive concept of what phase synchronization is. You can uh, look at this tutorial by Mike Cohen. I have a, there's a link here, the YouTube video. But you can have a look at these, uh, these squares. The important thing is that you can see that the phase difference in the signals is always the same, no? It's not important if they are more or less uh, shifted, but this consistency, consistency, sorry, a long time, is what uh, gives you this sense of uh, synchronized phase. And of course, it's dynamic. It can appear and disappear depending depending on the condition. And this guy, this Mike Cohen, has a, a very nice book and a lot of tutorials, uh, also with code that you can use. So it's a nice way to start if you are if you want to have a look at at these kind of things. Okay. Similar to phase synchronization. Uh, is coherent or coherency. Uh, I know this, uh, this equation starts to look too complicated, but in the end it's just an average of a, a spectral estimation. And uh, the thing is that coherence is the equivalent to a cross-correlation function, but it has the ability to tell you which frequencies are synchronized or are coupled. Probably you are more used to seeing this in this notation, like a, a cross spectrum and a, a product of a auto spectra uh, in the denominator. <clears throat> and uh, why coherence or coherency? This is coherence. You can also see this formula squared, usually called as magnitude squared coherence. But if you avoid the, the magnitude operator in the numerator, then you get a complex value uh, measure that is called coherency. And uh, well, coherency has some nice properties that uh, well, I'll explain later. This is what you get when you study coherence, for example. You, this is an example with motor uh, activity. Uh, and you can see how special rhythms in the brain at different levels of contraction uh, show synchronization between different regions of the brain. That's it. The good thing about this measure is that it has uh, interesting relatives like the phase slope index or the imaginary part of the coherence, which are, uh, I tend to see that everything after year 2000 is, is recent, but it's not. 20 years now, no? But for example, the phase loop index is a more generic quantity uh, that is calculated from this complex value coherency. And uh, under very specific situations in which you can say that two regions are uh, related, you can infer the, also the direction uh, of this coupling. Uh, if there are many complex interactions, this phase loop index may fail at, at uh, identifying this, this uh, connectivity, but uh, it's used it sometimes. And the imaginary part of the coherency deals with uh, an issue that affects uh, EEG signals, especially, uh, well, it does not depend on, on the number of sensors, but is if you have a lot of sensors, it makes sense that if you have a, an underlying source, the, the deeper the source, the more spread you will see uh, this activity on your sensors. So how much of the relationship of the signal that you see in those sensors is real interaction or is just one source that has been spread to the other? So imaginary coherency uh, neglects the real part of this quantity because it is related to this spread and takes uh, into account only the, the projection to the imaginary axis, which is related to, let's say, uh, interaction. The thing that is propagating, uh, it's interacting, not propagating uh, at zero lag, let's say. Uh, 
it works, but you can also miss real interactions that are happening without lag. So it depends on the study that you're making. You, you may not have results at all. It has happened to me. No? I have uh, applied it and, and sometimes you see, for example, that uh, the pharmacological effect on the brain is very evident. You can see it on the patient and then you don't get, you can see it looking at the traces of the EEG and then the imaginary coherency doesn't get you significant results. But, but it's an interesting measure and uh, later it will, it will appear again in my talk. Okay, and some cousins of the of coherence. If you normalize signals, you get the face locking value. The nice thing about, about the face locking value, not the formula, is that uh, it is thought to reflect better the phase synchronization than coherence. In coherence, you mix amplitude and phases. So by the, by this normalization, you are getting closer to only the the phase term. And it has, it has also uh, some relatives that are interesting, like the phase lock -like index and the weighted phase lock -like index. And let me go to the next slide. If you remember the original formulas of, co of coherence, we had a cross spectrum, and uh, it has a. If you don't take the magnitude, it has a a, a phase. If you plot that phase in the complex plane, you get something like this. And you can see that, for example, all the phases are between 0 and 90 degrees, which is okay. It's a measure. But usually our measurements are noisy, so you can get things like that. You know, a phase close to 0 or negative even. And if you are taking averages, then your measure might end being non -significant, not significant. So what the phase lock index does is to neglect everything that is on the real axis, similar, sorry, similar to what uh, imaginary, co imaginary coherence is doing, and takes uh, into account only positive or negative uh, uh, phase differences. And there's uh, a slightly modified version, the weighted phase lock index, that assigns a uh, growing weight uh, as you uh, go far away from the real axis. Uh, well, these are other measures that you can apply to, to try and detect uh, functional connectivity. Okay. If we jump to the information theoretical domain, in which uh, we are considering just the probability distribution of the signals, one interesting and interesting quantity is the mutual information, uh, which is nothing less than the nonlinear equivalent of the cross correlation function. Well, I just put the equations here because uh, they were in my thesis and they mean a lot to me, but. Uh, Imagine that X and Y are two uh, variables, uh, two measurements, two signals of your EEG. So the amount of information that is carried by one of those signals can be measured by the Shannon entropy, which is just this uh, equation based on the probabilities and the log probabilities of, of the signal. These can be measured in bits if the logarithm is base two or nuts if it's natural logarithm or Hadley's or whatever, if it's uh, uh, logarithm to the 10th, uh, but it's just a measure. No, you measure the amount of information that is carried by, by a signal, is this uh, represented in this circle, the, am the amount of information of another signal can be this other circle, and the whole, no, the joint information of the two signals would be represented by the overlapping of those. The mutual information is just this common region between those two. So if you consider this Shannon entropy and this other Shannon entropy, then mutual information is just 
one plus the other minus the joint and you get only this region at the center and if you go through all the mathematical derivation you get this equation like here and that's it but it's just a nonlinear correlation and well you can find uh more complicated equations in this paper but uh, as the correlation you can calculate uh, it statically or you can uh, shift both signals and depending on the lag between them you get a nice waveform that characterizes this coupling uh, over time and last but not least uh, we should talk about directionality nothing that i've said uh, until now apart from a very specific case is telling us if one signal is driving the other all of them were measures of uh, coupling or uh, synchronization or whatever that tells uh, uh, tells us about the relationship between signals but not if one comes before the other so this is something that Cliff Granger uh, already thought about in, he was an economist, I don't know if he's alive or not. Uh, he, he dealt with this uh, some years ago. And strictly speaking, uh, we can say that one signal or one data, Granger causes another, X causes Y. If you predict Y, based on past y and the prediction is worse than when you predict y based on x and y so if x adds something to this prediction then x comes before y and is causing in some way uh, uh, it, it, there's a causal relationship between x and y so after that uh, well, you can find measures of causality in many toolboxes, uh, MATLAB, Python, whatever. But uh, as I said, I come from the field of uh, model-free measures and uh, entropies and so on. So I found this uh, measure called transfer entropy, which is a version of mutual information that operates on conditional probabilities. So you condition the information of one signal to the other. So you get this sense of uh, prediction. No? If you add more information, including another variable, then somehow this is adding, is <coughs> predicting the next. And uh, you can find the original definition in this uh, year 2000 paper. But uh, then there was a lot of mathematical discussion on that and somebody the proof that Granger causality and transfer entropy are equivalent if the proper distributions of the data are, are met. So in the end, uh, something that was very natural for me, which is calculating entropies, uh, gave me a tool to assess this directionality in, in terms of functional connectivity. Okay, I've waited like 20 slides to show you my first uh, reference, so, but this is the equation. Uh, okay, everything that I talked about, talks about X and Y. So these are pairwise measures. What do we do if uh, we have a 32 channel, 64 channel EEG, uh, then of course statistics comes into play. Uh, you have to take into account that some of your measurements might be significant by chance uh, or you can take into account multivariate uh, extensions of those these measures that i presented or you can do graph or network approaches which is the topic that my colleague Saul will present you later and of course you have to take into account uh, other issues like common inputs this issue of the spreading <coughs> of the field if you have only one source and you measure it in, in several sensors or even the problem that you might not be observing everything with the sensors that you have and you have the effect of other uh, sources that are affecting uh, your readings and 
might give you a different conclusion. Usually, uh, uh, statistical corrections are enough to get some significant maps uh, in terms of uh, functional connectivity, which is why uh, what I will show in later in the example. So before the examples, uh, we've seen fMRI, we've seen EEG. Uh, Carolina told us before that they are more or less similar, but they are not the same. They measure brain activity, but not in the same uh, way. So, well, it's true that they provide complementary information. They mostly measure the activity of the synapse. And somebody took the time to uh, do this uh, study measuring fMRI and EEG at the same time and calculating uh, connectivity measures to see if they would match or not. And one of the conclusions of the, this uh, 2021 paper, this is quite recent, is that for high frequency bands and uh, selected measures like the imaginary part of the coherency, there is correlation between fMRI and EEG. So with the proper uh, set uh, of the experiments, you can at least uh, set the ground to ensure that you're measuring more or less the same, that your paradigm is working and that uh, what you're measuring with both techniques is giving you, let's say, the same picture. Okay, that's all for the relationship. And now I'm going to go through some examples, mostly uh, easy connectivity studies uh, that we've done at our research group, dealing with uh, the drug effect or uh, uh, the effect of uh, sleep or sleep deprivation. We've also studied Anna is hyperventilating because the last <laughs> is her study. We've also uh, studied Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and Red syndrome. And I will also uh, tell you which technique uh, we used in, in, in each one. For example, in, in one of the first studies uh, I, I took part, uh, studying the drug effect on the brain, uh, I used this mutual information. The, the idea was try to describe where, where, what were the short uh, time, short, short term effects uh, caused by, by an anxiolytic ultrasolam. And uh, one of the nice things that we saw is that if, if you look at a classical functional connectivity measure, you see the effect. But if you use mutual information and you divide it into the linear and the nonlinear contributions, the nonlinear contribution, which is max under the linear because it's bigger, is much more uh, representative or uh, it, it matches much more the profile of the plasma measurements getting from blood samples. And this was uh, something I did not expect to find, but it's, it's there. Here you can see that uh, I depicted some of the maps completely empty, and those maps were those where statistical significance was not uh, achieved. If you don't get enough lines, then it, probably they are random uh, measurements, so you cannot ensure. You cannot say that this is the picture of the underlying brain, but we have some nice uh, maps in there. And in the lower figure, you can see in blue were the plasma measurements. Uh, these lower traces were the linear uh, part of the mutual information, but the nonlinear part, the green one, was much closer to, to these uh, plasma measurements. So we also 
evaluated different kinds of drugs. Uh, this was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Hospital of, Hospital de San Pau. And uh, in here, we we wanted to see this causal effect of, uh, in this case, I think it was, uh, it was a, a psychoactive drug, uh, and a hallucinogen. Okay. Ayahuasca, exactly. And uh, in addition to these uh, maps showing which were the significant connections, this is the starting time. You give them the drug, and then you do periodic measurements. You can see at some point there's a decrease, an increase, and then a decrease of these uh, connections, this functional connectivity. But with transfer entropy, you can see also which are the origins or the sources and the sinks of this transfer of information, which is something that I, as an engineer, I'm not able to interpret. But the doctors and pharmacologists in there, they said, wow, no, you are seeing something that comes from posterior areas and goes to frontal areas and this has they have all the theory behind it. and this was a repeated dose uh, so the second dose had lower effects after the first but when you did a delayed dose you had you could see something in between so it made sense that the results we got were consistent and okay we also have uh these nice graphs uh, comparing the concentration of this hallucinogen in in plasma and uh, the number of lines we got in the map, or this correlation between uh, different uh, connectivity measures and uh, this plasma concentration. So, and transfer entropy got the highest results in this sense. So not only measuring connectivity, but measuring the direction of these interactions gave us the best results. And, uh, something similar done with sleep deprivation. Here uh, you can see just an example of a measure of the sleep propensity and how transfer entropy in some regions of the brain followed very well this, uh, this trend. No? And the added information about transfer entropy is that it not not only measures the, this sleep propensity, but gives you a sense of directionality of which areas of the brain are driving uh, this, uh, this somnolence. No? Uh, okay, so this is, uh, well, we th there were a lot of measurements. Uh, I only plotted here from every four hours, but we had a lot of measurements along the night, uh, well, along the hours. And this is how how the traces look and which areas are influencing, are causing uh, uh, this, uh, driving this uh, functional connectivity between these. Another interesting study, it was, uh, this was carried out by a student uh, of mine uh, in his thesis, a study transfer entropy in a very specific population of people who had a mutation uh, that they will surely develop Alzheimer's disease. And uh, they already know through fMRI uh, which areas of the brain are going to be affected. And this is where they place the electrodes and they measure. And, well, they perform uh, 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 some uh, cognitive tests and they were uh, looking at the reaction times and other measurements, among them the EEG. And they saw that these... Uh, connections uh, as measured per transfer, uh, by the transfer entropy uh, increased during an encoding task. So it, it was harder for them to learn things even 10, 15 years before developing Alzheimer's. So this is uh, with a simple technique like an EEG, you don't need an fMRI, 
they could uh, they could see this this effect in in these people. Okay, getting to the last two examples, uh, different technique this time. Uh, this is a study uh, led by Alejandro, in which uh, they explored the coupling patterns uh, during an, an oddball task with a schizophrenia patient. And, well, the interesting thing about this is that uh, patients fail to adapt uh, the, the coupling dynamics of the brain does not adapt to the task. So they show like an impaired uh, connectivity that is not present in, in controls. You know, if you see uh, the controls adapt and change, you can see all these maps. And there are fewer lines, fewer connectivity changes, and even blues mean <coughs> A decrease and reds mean an increase so even the change when it's present is it's in the wrong uh, sense of the connectivity no? so uh, well the, the the conclusion was that connectivity was reflecting impaired communication between the, these neural areas and as a last uh, study one of the the latest things we've been doing with that, which is uh, in press right now, was uh, to investigate the effect of uh, cognitive stimulation with uh, uh, red syndrome patients. Uh, and the nice thing about the study is that even you cannot uh, say if the patients are uh, they are offered different kind of stimulus, active and passive, and passive uh, exercises, but it seems that active tasks are increasing this uh, connectivity in the brain. So getting these patients to improve their attention then leads to a, a greater increase in quality of life. So this is something that the, the doctors are very interested in. And uh, well, it's something that... Uh, it has to be further studied, but it seems that now we have a, a lead to which kind of exercises can be applied in this in this activity. So uh, that's all I had prepared. Uh, if you have any question or comment, and if not, coming up next, my colleague Sol. <laughs>